Thank you so much, Monica. And thanks, everyone, for coming. Um, I, I want to preface my talk this morning by saying I'm, I'm currently engaged on several research projects. One of them is uh, looking at um, the role of Aboriginal women artists in Canada over the past, well, century. And uh, I want to really, you know, locate them within uh, Canada's art history. So um, to that end, I have begun with um, um, uh, a, an investigation into three artists um, and their particular uh, relationship with arts activism and how they have changed the course of Aboriginal art history over the past 50 years, say. And, uh, and, these, and these artists are uh, Joan Cardinal Schubert, who uh, you see here in her studio in the, the late 1980s, uh, Daphne Ojig, um, a few years ago on the occasion of her Governor General's Award, and uh, Doreen Jensen. And um, each of these artists advanced the recognition of Aboriginal art in Canada. But my talk is going to focus on their roles within distinct and usually male-dominated moments in this recent Canadian art history. That is Daphne Ojig and the so-called Indian Group of Seven in the early 1970s, uh, Doreen Jensen and the formation of the Society of Canadian Artists, <coughs> sorry, um, of Native Ancestry, SCANA, in the early 1980s, and Joan Cardinal Schubert and a third wave of contemporary Aboriginal artists throughout the 1980s. Each approached their practice with a different intent, but shared resilience, strength, and focus in the face of racism and sexism. They addressed mutual concerns that included government control over the lives of Aboriginal peoples, the perpetuation of harmful stereotypes as well as the exclusion of Aboriginal art from galleries and critical discourses. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm trying to get over a cold, so I need to get my water. Daphne Ojig was born in 1919. I'll just put it back to Daphne was born in 1919 on the Wikwimikong unceded Indian territory on Manitoulin Island, Ontario. Her early work from the 1960s and 1970s was groundbreaking, not only for its subject matter and formal, <coughs> sorry, and formal approach, but also because she was one of the few, if not the only, Aboriginal women artists working towards individual artistic agency at that time during the 60s and 70s. Her mature signature style combines the colors, fluid lines, and subject matter of Anishinaabe art styles with European modernist abstraction introduced into Canada after World War II through many arts publications. And this is an example. It's a very strong work. It's a work she completed in 1978. It's in the Canadian Museum of Civilization. It's titled The Indian in Transition. And it's nine feet by 27 feet. <clears throat> Daphne's life as an artist parallels the early history of contemporary Aboriginal art in Canada and its development in the face of multiple racial and gender-biased constraints. Many writers have argued that Norval Morisot's distinct, distinctive art style directly influenced Daphne's own artistic development. On the contrary, I would argue that any limited exposure she may have had to the emergent stylistic convention of the Woodland or Anishinaabe school, as it's come to be called, in the mid-1960s fueled her own distinctly innovative approach to abstraction. During, during this early formative period, the works of Picasso and other modernist artists influenced Daphne through the many post-war art books she studied at various libraries. Daphne disavows membership in this Anishinaabe school. Indeed, her works stand alone in their reaffirmation of the central role of women as cultural custodian. By example, uh, Daphne created several images of Thunderbird woman depicting the metamorphosis of a woman to avian form. 
Norval Morisot was known, and many of his colleagues were known for their man changing into Thunderbird. They weren't uh, widely published at that time, and um, Daphne certainly no knew that, uh, that story from oral history. And this is an example of several works that Daphne did on Thunderbird Woman, and um, it's from 1971, and it's uh, mixed media on board. Daphne was the first artist to depict the female perspective of this love narrative in which a man transforms himself into a Thunderbird in order to be with a Thunderbird woman whom he loves and has married. After living in various communities in northern Manitoba for several years in 1971, Daphne and her husband moved to Winnipeg where they opened a small craft store. As one of the very few Aboriginal-owned craft shops in Canada at the time, it became a focus for First Nations artists and craftspeople from across the country. It was here in the early 70s that Daphne fet, first met Norval Morisot. He was a regular visitor in the growing circle of Aboriginal artists who met in her shop to discuss common interests, including their almost complete exclusion from the larger Canadian arts landscape. One notable exception to this exclusion was a groundbreaking exhibition at the Winnipeg Art Gallery called Treaty Numbers 23, 287, and 1171, which included Jackson Beardy, Alex Janvier, and Daphne Ojig. And I have to just say, I'm saying Janvier because um, that's how Alex pronounces his name. And I know that it's uh, somewhat grating on your ears, especially here in Montreal, um, but there's a certain um, politics and history of uh, anglicizing some of these names in, in Western Canada. So he is Janvier. Um, the three artists uh, shared the same challenges in trying to gain critical attention for their artwork. They strongly opposed the existing government marking strategies that focused solely on economic development for Indian arts and crafts. They decided to work collectively in an attempt to gain national recognition for Aboriginal art based upon its individual merits. To this end, in 1974, in Winnipeg, a group of seven artists who had been meeting informally at Daphne's shop officially incorporated as the Professional Native Indian Artists Incorporated, or PNIAI. And those artists were, were Ojig, Janvier, Jackson Beardy, Morisot, Carl Ray, Eddie Kobanes, and Joseph Sanchez. Known colloquially um, as the Indian Group of Seven, the group became the first activist Aboriginal artist collective. Their plan was straightforward. They planned to establish an independent fund free of government domination through sales of their work at commercial galleries. This fund would allow time for professional artists to paint and would encourage emerging artists through both the group's travel to Aboriginal communities to do mentorships and through a scholarship program. And here are a couple of examples of, um, of Daphne's paintings at that time. And this is uh, In the Bosom of the Earth in 1969, and it's pastel on paper. And then um, a really particularly strong work from the early 19, well, from 1973, from Mother Earth Flows the River of Life, and it's acrylic on canvas. Just to, um, sorry, in the bosom of Mother Earth. No, it's, no, in the bosom of the Earth, not Mother Earth. Although the group disbanded in the mid-1970s, its two essential objectives provided the foundation for later activist organizations, that is, to provide support for individual artists and to lobby for the recognition of Aboriginal artists throughout the, <coughs> the country. Concurrent with the work of the Indian Group of Seven, Doreen Jensen worked tirelessly <clears throat> um, on many fronts to overcome the stereotypical, and I'm quoting Doreen, to overcome the stereotypical image of Aboriginal people and our art. By the early 1980s, she had been instrumental in developing and leading strategies for inclusion in the province and across the country for over a decade. 
She was born in 1933 in the Gitkasan village of Kispiox in northern central British Columbia and passed away in September 2009. In 1968, Doreen enrolled in the Kitten Mac School of Northwest Coast Art um, in Hazleton, close to her home. She completed the two-year certificate course specializing in design, wood carving, jewelry, and woodblock printing, all at that time defined as male arts. Since the early 1970s, her carvings and button blankets have been exhibited in group exhibitions nationally and, and internationally. And this is a work from 1974 called Gitkasan Portrait Mask, and it's alderwood, fur, feathers, and abalone shell. Doreen and Haida artist Frida Deesing were two of the first women carvers in the West Coast tradition. Of carving, Doreen said, and I quote her, I guess I had always thought of it as something the men did, that you had to have the knowledge of the tools and be strong, but it really just takes the sharp tools and technique." End of quote. Doreen and Frida were the only women included in the 1972 17-person exhibition, Kassan, Breath of Our Grandfathers, organized by the National Museum of Man, now the Canadian Museum of Civilization. While button blankets by five women artists were included in this exhibition, artistic credit was given only to the men who had originated each design. Similarly, women's woven baskets and hats were not recognized at art, as art at that time. However, the surface designs painted by men were so recognized. Both Doreen's artwork and activism challenged the then popular misconception that genderized the power structure of Aboriginal communities in Canada, assuming that only men were the important artists, spokespeople, and leaders. To quote Doreen, there are no divisions amongst our work. The baskets, the quill work boss boxes, the blankets made by the grandmothers, the women's work is art. If calling the work traditionally done by men, art now, is a way of validation for new audiences, then that which is done by women should also be so validated. I believe what I do now is a continuation of the way art was used in the old society. We are living, working, and creating art now, and the power of contemporary work that springs from the traditional roots must be seen. This is another mask by um, Doreen. It's Noble Woman with Librette. It's 1980. And it's poplar, human hair, rabbit skin, and paint. And this is one, and I apologize for um, the um, poor quality of this, but it's, it's a long story. I'll tell you sometime about getting this photograph. Um, and it's a noble Gitkasan Git woman mask with button blanket in 1980. And it's a, a mask that Doreen created uh, together with the um, button blanket. In a 1983 film titled Revival, Doreen sought to reestablish the important roles of women that had gone unrecognized until the present day. That same year, she had curated an exhibition of BC Aboriginal women artists at Women in Focus Gallery and had organized an Aboriginal women's retreat. And for many years, Doreen worked closely with the UBC Museum of Anthropology, where also in 1983, she curated the renowned internationally touring exhibition, Robes of Power, Totem Poles on Cloth. And she co-edited edited the book often described as the definitive work on button blankets. Published in 1986, I think that's blurry, I do apologize. Um, I think I'll just go back to her. Um, published in 1986 by the Kitten Max Northwest Coast Indian Arts Society, the book was the full length study of contemporary and historical functions and designs of these robes. Of course, Doreen corrected the gender imbalance that had existed by including equal numbers of blankets by women and men. It is important to note that in the early history of Aboriginal curatorial practices, Doreen and Joan Cardinal Schubert were the only two women curators in a male-dominated dom field within Canada, 
although it's also important to note that there weren't a lot of Aboriginal curators in Canada through the 70s and 80s, but those who were practicing, such as Gerald McMaster, Robert Houle, Tom Hill, Bob Boyer, um, it, was, it was still a very male-dominated uh, practice. And Doreen's contributions extended beyond the province to a number of national initiatives. She was the founding member. Sherry's here. <laughs> Don't want to send her you out. <laughs> Welcome. Um, she was the founding member and director of a number of national Aboriginal organizations, include the professional native, including the Professional Native Women's Association. Oh, excuse me. Association and the Society of Canadian Artists of Native Ancestry, or SCANA. And Doreen had organized a National Native Artists Symposium in Kassan on in August 1983. These national symposia, which began in 1978, were developed to create opportunities for artists to meet collectively and to share ideas and concerns. However, this third symposium went further. Doreen was a member of a working group created to formally address the systemic exclusion of Aboriginal art in diverse cu cultural contexts throughout the country. A decade following the disbanding of the Group of Seven, in 1984, the group, uh, <coughs> sorry, the SCANA group initiated frequent meetings with, official, with officials from the federal government and in January 1985, with initial funding from the federal government, SCANA was formally incorporated with Doreen Jensen and David General as co-chairs. Both Doreen and David continued in this capacity until the late 1980s. Although Doreen was one of four women on the original working committee of 11 members, colleagues have noted Doreen's tenacity in convincing department officials to, to support this incipient organization. And this is um, a photo of Doreen with a carved mask. It's, uh, it's undated, but it's the, it's the early 1980s. And in Doreen's words, SCANA was formed, quote, to give Native artists place and voice, and to claim space in Canada's major art museums for contemporary Native art." End of quote. SCANA's official mandate was to act as an Aboriginal art service organization with regional, provincial, and national arts institutions and funding agencies to develop programs and policies towards the inclusion of art by Canadian artists of Native ancestry. <clears throat> skip over. The role of uh, General and Jensen in establishing this organization underscores a bitter irony whereby artists working within more traditionally based genres were instrumental in bringing contemporary First Nations art to national attention and yet found themselves increasingly overlooked throughout the 1980s in favor of a new generation of postmodern innovators, as they were called then. Considered a member of this new generation of innovators, Joan Cardinal Schubert was born in, in 1942 and raised in the predominantly urban community of Red Deer, Alberta, the fourth and oldest girl in a family of eight children. Sadly, Joan passed away in September 2009, just two days before Doreen's death. Jo <clears throat> excuse me. Joan shared with Daphne and Doreen the will and determination to address the history of exclusion, appropriation, and misrepresentation experienced by Aboriginal communities and contemporary artists alike. Of her early motivations, she said, and this is a long quote, but it's very important, so I quote Joan. In 1969, at 27, I, like many Native people, had begun to realize that there was little or nothing celebrated about our people in this country. Clearly defined so-called places for Native people existed in the feathers and beads category. Our objects had been and continue to be collected, stored, and tagged. 
early watercolor paintings about the exotic other, modern media images of native people without names merge and create subtexts of stereotypes never representing a contemporized insider's view. Souvenir shops, popular culture, <coughs> literature and films, contemporary monikers on cars, toys, sports teams help to complete this lack of knowledge. Looking at these popular icons, I thought of my own babies and I said, God help them when they grow up and they are not just cute anymore. I wanted to create a new image of being Indian from the inside. Excuse me, I'm just going to have a quick drink of water. The need to address the exclusion of Aboriginal peoples in popular accounts of Canadian history informed her early paintings of historical First Nations figures such as Poundmaker, Crowfoot, Big Bear, and Métis leader Louis Riel. And this is one of Joan's um, earlier works. It's from 1978. It's titled Great Canadian Dream, Pray for Me, Louis Riel. And it's a triptych, as you can see, and it's a oil on canvas. In the early 1980s, Joan was part of the cohort which Alex Janvier has called the third wave of Aboriginal artists. Individuals who are mostly university educated and who have pushed contemporary Aboriginal arts in new directions since the early 1980s. This third wave of artists came to prominence in the early 1980s simultaneously with the debates around uh, appropriation identity, inclusion, representation, <coughs> sorry, and identity politics throughout Canada. And this group of nine or ten, as I colloquially call them, included Joan and uh, Jane Ash Poitra as the only other, as the only women, and together with uh, varying combinations of the men. Bob Boyer, Edward Poitras, Carl Beam, Robert Hull, Ron Naganosh, Domingo Cisneros, Mike McDonald, and Pierre Siwi who were all forging uh, new approaches in contemporary arts at that time. A number of group exhibitions throughout the next decade in different regions of the country pr proclaimed recognition of this third wave. Such exhibitions as new work by a new generation at the Mackenzie Art Gallery in Regina in 82, Stardusters, Thunder Bay Art Gallery in 86, Beyond History, Vancouver Art Gallery in 89, and Indigena at the Canadian Museum of Civilization in 92. Much of Joan's work addressed the museum's control over Aboriginal cultural representation and misinterpretation of historical objects. Works from <clears throat> late 80s speak to notions of cultural deprivation that she herself experienced upon viewing historical collections in museums. And there are two uh, bodies of work that I want to show you here. This, um, the next four images, um, are, it's from a work called Four Directions, War Shirts, My Mother's Vision. So, and uh, this, this is the spirit of the North. This is the spirit of the East. This is the spirit of the West. And this is the spirit of the South. Sorry, it's 1986. And it's oil, oil pastel, chalk, and graphite on paper. Another work from 1987. It's called One Little, Two Little, Three Little, Preservation of a Species. And it's oil on plaster. A former curator herself, Joan also criticized the categorization and labeling and subsequent early dismissal of Native art by non-Aboriginal curators. However, she no noted that when Aboriginal curators came on the scene and called the same works Native art, it was different because the community had claimed agency and declared, to quote her, who we were, not being told by others. Throughout her career, Joan addressed multiple aspects of the painful colonial history of Aboriginal peoples, from the plundering of ancient burial sites to the devastating impact of residential schools on generations of individuals. She approached these volatile subjects from a personal yet highly accessible perspective that, quote, finds a universality which transcends particulars. 
1985, she became only the fourth woman in Alberta to be included in the Royal Canadian Academy of the Arts. And today there are significantly more women, obviously, but including um, Aboriginal artists such as Faye Heavishiel and Jane Ash Poitra. By the end of that year, 1985, Joan had left her full-time position as curator at the Nicol Arts Museum at the University of Calgary to become a full-time artist. She spent much time at writing on Stone Park in Alberta, reflecting upon the many ancestral artists and images found on the, the pictographs there. And this is uh, a work from that time, 1985, and it's called Three, Three Raiders and It's Pastel on Paper. Joan was also active as a speaker and writer and worked in theater, film, and video, as well as many commu community issues. She was truly um, an interdisciplinary community activist. Her goal in these pursuits was always to celebrate the positive aspects of Aboriginal peoples and to always dispel negative stereotypes. She led various debates regarding Aboriginal rights, land claims, education, and healing. She discussed the ethics of museum policies and the appropriation of Aboriginal imagery incessantly throughout her career. So, in conclusion, through their art and activision, activism, oh, I'm sorry, activism, all three artists have been in the forefront of changes that today define contemporary Aboriginal arts. Daphne developed her own distinct style in the face of government marketing pressures and played a leadership role with PNIAI, the Indian Group of Seven, as the group worked toward the recognition of professional artists. Doreen's art challenged the male-dominated canons of West Coast carving. She worked tirelessly in her roles in SCANA and other organizations for the recognition of contemporary Aboriginal women artists. And as part of the third wave of artists, Joan's work was in the forefront of efforts to claim space and voice in today's diverse artistic landscape. And each has an important story in the multiple conversations that are now happening around Canada's art history. So that's it. Thank you.